camera one. Camera and then one. All right. Now, now, Mike, we need your computer. Mike, all we need is your computer now. Okay. Now, he, for one again, after you get his computer up there. Wait till his computer comes. I might be able to do it. He told me that I'm going to Okay, now, camera one. Oh, you're still on the far camera. Move it to the near camera. Now, camera one. There we go. Now you're up and running. So you've got me. I've got you and your computer. Okay, great. And your break is at uh, two at uh, two fifteen your time, right? Two fifteen our time, yes, sir. All right, three fifteen our time. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Well, welcome back to Ministry Technologies. We yesterday went over some introductory material about the Logos Bible software. We're going to spend a considerable amount of time in this software. So um, if you would please launch your Libronix uh, or Logos Bible software. There's always kind of a question as to what this thing is called. Um, it's the Libronix li Digital Library System. It's the Logos Bible software that uses the Libronix digital library system. So uh, half the time I call it Logos, half the time I call it Libronix. Just start your software. Uh, and, <laughs> and you can determine what you want to call it. I think the most technically correct uh, terminology is that it is the Logos Bible software, or Logos, depending on how you wish to pronounce the Greek. Um, I mentioned a couple of things yesterday that, I, that are important. We went through this whole uh, home page, and if you would, make sure that you close all and open home. That's this little icon in your menu bar up at the top that ha looks like a little tiny house with a, excuse me, with a page behind it and a little arrow. So make sure that you click that and close all and open home. The other thing you, you'll notice is if you hover over uh, these commands, a lot of them will tell you what the keyboard shortcut is. For example, on the Windows platform, it's Alt, Control, Home will do the same thing as this icon does. So if you can, get in the habit of learning at least some of the basic uh, keyboard shortcuts. It will really speed up your time. For example, even just cut and paste. I work with a few uh, gentlemen upstairs, and I'll watch them select something and then go up to the menu and do pull down copy and then go somewhere and go up to the menu and pull down paste. If you just do control C for copy and control V for paste, it's a little quicker. So if you can learn, start to get in the habit of learning some keyboard shortcuts, they'll speed you up quite a bit. Uh, they'll save you a little bit of time. We um, covered pretty much the entire study uh, study passage, we went through Bible only and Bible commentary. Uh, we went through the passage guide, and we were getting ready to start the exegetical guide. But before we do that, there are a couple of things that I didn't mention that I want to mention, and there's a couple of uh, tools. Because we were playing with John 3.16, there are a couple of tools and reports in the passage guide that don't function because, uh, for example, biblical people, there were no names in John 3.16, so you didn't get anything. So I want to go back for just a second and show you a neat little trick. We talked about when you type in a passage, for example, uh, John 3.16, that you get this pericope list, this drop-down list of all of these different pericopes that are trying to match what you're typing in. Since you have pericope lists, one of the really cool things that you can do is you can actually type in words from those pericope lists to find passages. For example, if you want to find uh, a, the section on Noah building the ark, but you don't remember where it is, just type in Noah and ark, and you'll notice that you start to get some interesting things. Now, none of these are Noah and the ark, but what about Noah and flood? Noah and the Flood, Genesis 6, 9 through 7, 4. 
or 724. So if you click on that and you enter that as your pericope and hit go, guess what? Your Bible's going to open right to that section of Genesis. So using those pericope titles, uh, and again, they're just the subheadings out of the different translations of the Bible, you can actually find passages that you, de- you don't necessarily know exactly where they reside. Does that make sense? So if you want to find the, the parable of the uh, virgins, for example, you should be able to type in parable of the virgins, and it's going to help get you to that section. All right. Now, um, I'm going to change this because it's actually running a report on Genesis 6, 9 through 7, 24. Just run a passage guide on Genesis 6, verse 9. Not the whole pericope, but just that verse. And let it run for a second. I want to show you uh, this biblical people report. Biblical people is really very cool. Especially if you're like me. I struggle with some of the Old Testament connections. How, how the names all fit together sometimes. And when you run Genesis 6-9, you'll notice that you've got your commentary section that we talked about before. Right under that is the cross sections. And all I'm doing is clicking on the little plus and minus next to those titles to collapse them. But you'll notice that now in Biblical People, I have a chart. And Noah is in the center, and I've got his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then I have Canaan and Lamech. If you click on any one of those nodes, you will generate this family tree for that particular person. So I clicked on Shem, and you'll notice now I have Shem's entire family tree. Noah was his father. Look at all the sons that he had. Uh, Aram, Ashur, Elam, Lud, (laughs) Meshech, and so on. You have sons of Aram. When you click on Uz, for example, it's going to regenerate this report for that particular person. This is really cool. All we did was type in a a passage in a passage guide, but we can get to all of this information uh, about these various folks. Uh, So that can be really powerful and can really help you. In this report, one of the things that I want you to notice is across the top, it has verses where these names occur, where these people are listed, and then it also may have other names, uh, people, names that they're known for, uh, or other names that are related to this particular person. But then along the left-hand side, it'll have related people. For example, this report is on Aram, but it shows me that his father was Shem, and where I can find out those passages that tell that Shem is his father. And Gether is his son, and Genesis 10.23 will indicate to me that Gether is actually the son of Aram, and so on. So you can follow the family trees of people going all the way through. Now, theoretically, and it's, I don't imagine it's theoretical, but the only reason I say that is because I have not done it. If you start with the uh, genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, you should be able to start with the first name and work your way all the way through. Uh, each generation going all the way through and see some of them. If you want to just look for a particular person while this report is up, just select the name that's at the top in the entry box. Type in David. Now, David's chart takes a second to load because um, you'll see that David's family tree is pretty elaborate. (coughs) Denny back there saying, I'm done. But look at this family tree. Look at how detailed it is. You can print these out. You can copy and paste them into a PowerPoint if you want to. You lose the hyperlinks. Uh, But all of this information about David, and all I did was run a biblical people report and type in the name David. And it's all there for you to find. This bit, and I'm going to show you how to run a biblical people report uh, from someplace other than a passage guide. That brings me to a good point, and that is that all of these reports that I'm showing you that are part of a passage guide or an exegetical guide or that you run from your homepage, 
there are ways to run them individually. You don't have to run an entire passage guide, for example, to run a biblical people report, uh, and we'll look at that. Uh, but for right now, the easiest place to start with, remember we kind of talked about this being on autopilot. I'm trying to show you if you, if you know what your pericope is for a Bible class or you know what your pericope is for a sermon, well, close all, open home, type it into a passage guide, and start to get that background information that you need to get about your pericope. Uh, let Logos decide what reports to run initially to get you to all of this information. Later on, you can switch to a more manual mode and you can do some other things, and we're going to get all of that. Uh, but right now, we're just kind of trying to look at what it can do just by simply typing in your pericope. Does anybody have any questions about uh, the Biblical People Report for, for right now? <coughs> Pardon? I don't know um, you don't know where to type a pericope? You need to expand biblical people um, and just uh, scroll down. Click on click on one of these people. That's going to open the whole report. Now, if you would just type David where it says Ham, it will change to David and so on. Questions about bi biblical people? For those of you that want to do profiles and, and biblical character studies... This is an awesome tool to get you started. You've got a lot of information that you can get to right here. Their history, a number of places where their names are mentioned, and, and you can follow all of that through. So it makes sense. Yes? Can you change um, the, like, you say, I just want to see David's wives. No. You can't do that? Okay. Not at this point. No, it's, it's showing you the whole tree, and I don't know of, of any way to filter it down. Um, now, you'll notice that it's all color-coded and it's all labeled. So, if you needed to find his wives, it's all right here. You've got Abigail, Ahio, Am, uh, Bathsheba, and excuse my butchering of the Hebrew, Denny. So, that's it. You get three wives, apparently. I don't find a fourth. So, so all that information is in here. You just have to dissect it from the chart. Questions, comments about that? Okay. Close all and open home again. One of the other things that I want to talk about, since we were talking about pericopes and pericope sets, uh, and the reason I want to mention it, we're going to kind of go into manual mode here for just a second, is because Denny just mentioned it in class, and so that I don't forget it, I want to show it to you. There is a way to compare the pericope sets from one version of your Bible to another. Now, again, pericope titles are just those section headings that say, this particular translation shows that these ten verses were part of this pericope, Another translation may have it part of a larger pericope or a smaller pericope, uh, and we just need to, to kind of play with it from there. Go under Tools, Bible Comparison, and then Compare Pericopes. So Tools at the top, then scroll down to Bible Comparison and, and Compare Pericopes. It keeps making an interesting noise behind me. I've just got Genesis 1.1, and I'm just going to click OK and let this generate. And you'll notice that I've got three versions in mine. I'll show you in a minute how to change that. But the NAS has a pericope of the creation from Genesis 1.1 to Genesis 1.31, and then chapter 2 is the second pericope. But you'll notice the ESV says the beginning of creation is Genesis 1.1, and then it looks like verse 3 starts a new pericope, the six days of creation, and then chapter 2 has the seventh day, God rests, and so on. So it's a way for you to p compare how those various Bibles are broken up into pericopes. 
And if you scroll through, it's just going to keep breaking it down for you. Right. When you hover, when you leave your cursor in that particular area near the title, it'll give you just that pericope in a window. Now, if you want to change what versions are being shown, click on the Properties button. It's kind of in the upper right-hand corner of the window. And you can turn off and turn on other pericopes. And let it regenerate. Now I have the NES 95 update, the ESV, the NIV, the New King James, and the New Revised Standard all right there. And as I scroll through, you'll be able to notice if there are any really significant differences uh, in the way things are broken out. Some of them, you'll notice, are almost identical in sections. Uh, but as you get to some places, here's an example. In Genesis 26, the NAS breaks the chapter down into three major pericopes, whereas most everybody else only breaks it down into one or two. Um, so you'll, you, you can just see how the various translations have broken out the pericopes. It's a great way to decide whether you're violating a pericope boundary or not, or at least give you some input as to when you're choosing a pericope, are you finding the beginning and end of the particular pericope? Now, is any of this inspired? No. I mean, these pericope boundaries are man-made. Don't feel like there's not times when you may see that a pericope breaks these boundaries. Uh, that's probably not uncommon. So uh, don't, don't worry about that too much. But I wanted to show you how to run that report. Uh, we would have seen it later, but since it was on our minds from uh, class today, I wanted to go ahead and show you how to do that. Go ahead and just close that report. Questions about the, the passage guide at this point? Anything that we've looked at in the passage guide? No? Are you awake today? Okay. What I want to do is I want to move on to the exegetical guide. Now, many of you are taking a class called Exegesis right now. Uh, what before you run the guide, what do you think an exegetical guide is going to do? Miles, what do you think you're going to get out of an exegetical guide? Okay. In, in what capacity? I mean, it's going to exegete it, but we've talked about exegesis. Some of it, you have to figure out context and those kinds of things. Software is not going to be able to do that for you. So what, what types of exegetical tools would you think you're going to find in there? There you go. Words. Grammar. It, we're going to start to get into the technical aspects of a passage. Okay? So select the exegetical guide. And let's go back to John 3.16 just for fun since we were doing that the other day. Click John 3.16. Now, you can't type OHN because it's not that smart. And run your exegetical guide. I've tried to make my fonts a little bit bigger so that you can maybe see it a little bit better. Uh, I realize that you know it's not always sharp on the screen. Part of that is because we're recording. Uh, but we're working on that. But I think you can at least follow along. I think you can see my cursor a little bit better from the back than you could the other day. Uh, so kind of look up to see where I am, but then look at your screen and, and make the comparison. <coughs> when, when you run the exegetical guide, the first thing that it does is it shows you your passage and it highlights certain words. Now, you may have more words highlighted than I do. That's okay. I'm going to show you how to control which words are part of this report uh, as we go on. But you'll notice that my Greek text is set to, set to the Nestle Milan uh, 27th edition. All right? Yours may be different, but it should be a Greek text. Uh, the reason is because you are now trying to do exegetical work, right? So it's showing you what the original language tools are. Go to the Greek text, just leave the NAS. 
Did anybody else get the NAS on an exegetical guide? Okay. Select at the top of this menu. You'll notice right next to the uh, current reference box, there is the different Greek text. And make sure that you select the Greek text, either the NA27 or the UBS4. Uh, and that should solve the problem, but I'm not sure why it went to the NAS95 on yours, Danny. We'll have to look at that. But you're now starting to get into the original language, as I asked Miles. When you start to approach an exegetical approach to a, a passage of Scripture, one of the things that Denny mentioned in class is that you're going to want to do word studies, right? You're going to want to start to break down the passage and see how it's constructed, look at it grammatically, look at it from a word study standpoint, and that's what this tool helps you to do. Now, before we go through the, the parts of the tool, I want to show you some properties that we, uh, we can select to, to change it. I already showed you, you can use, uh, you can change the particular Greek text, but click on properties for a minute. We're not going to go through all of these right now. We'll go through more of them later. But this breaks down all of the various aspects of this report. The one that I want you to look at for right now is in this section called word by word. Okay. It's the fourth one down, or should be about the fourth one down on your list. It should have a check mark next to it. And there are some choices that you have inside that area. You'll notice one of the first ones is show verse text. Well, we want to see the text because we want to be able to break the text down. So make sure that's selected. The second one is interesting. It's filter out words whose lemmas occur more than 50 times. Well, there's an interesting vocabulary word here that you need to understand. And that, and that is what Logos uses, the term lemma. Lemma is the dictionary or lexical form of a Greek word. Okay. Now, those of you that are just starting Greek class, uh, that may not make complete sense to you yet. It will soon. Uh, when you look at a Greek text, oftentimes you're looking at a form of the word in the manuscript. Uh, it's already been parsed. It's a uh, aorist tense or it's an active participle. And so it takes on a particular form, but there is a root, there is a dictionary form to that word uh, that is how you would look it up in Art and Gingrich, for example, or how you would look it up in TD&T. And we often use the term the lexical form of that word because that's how you look it up in a lexicon. Uh, but lemma is a, a synonym for the lexical form of the word. So what is this doing? What it's telling you is that it's going to filter out any word who occurs in your New Testament more than a certain number of times. The idea here is that if you get used to the word agapao, for example, you've done word studies on love, you're very familiar with the word agapao, and it occurs a significant number of times in your text, you can turn that off. If the word the appears 8,000 times in your New Testament, well, do you really want a broken out... A detailed word study of the article the. Well, no. I mean, that's just taking up time in your report that you don't really need. So you can set this to a number that if a, if a word occurs more than that number of times, it's not going to show up in your, in your report. Uh, a lot of times, you're going to set this number initially pretty high uh, to filter out a, uh, the, of, those kinds of words. Uh, I Truthfully, I just turn mine off, and I'll show you why in just a second. But as your Greek vocabulary becomes better and better, you can reduce that number and get to those words that occur less, frequent, less frequently in the New Testament. Does that make sense? Everybody understand what that filter does? Okay. The next, re the next section is why I don't bother to, to use that as much, and that is it says include only these parts of speech. You can have it only give you verbs or only give you nouns or adjectives or pronouns or conjunctions. Now, I have mine set to show me the verbs, show me the nouns, and show me the adjectives. Pronouns and conjunctions, I'm not all that concerned about right now. Uh, so that, that's why only certain words are being highlighted in my Greek text. Is it's only showing me verbs, nouns, and adjectives. You can turn all of those off or on how you would like, but I wanted to show you why yours may be highlighting more words or less words than mine is. Does that make sense? Okay, 
go ahead and say okay. We're, we're not going to look at the rest of these preferences for right now. Uh, we'll do that when we look at this report in more detail later. Now, how many of you can read this Greek sentence in John 3.16? There's like five of you, okay? The rest of us are kind of stuck, aren't we? I mean, you got a bunch of Greek words. Half of you probably don't even know how to pronounce the letters, let alone, you know, the one that looks like a P is actually an R and all that kind of stuff. Go up to the top, and I want you to select in your list, instead of your Greek text, I want you to select the ESV New Testament Reverse Interlinear. We're going to do a lot of talking about the ESV reverse interlinear, uh, and I'll try to explain why as we go along. It's not so much that I like the ESV translation, although with the exception of a couple of spots that I think it's done a horrible job, uh, it's a pretty good translation overall. But what they've done is they have packaged this, this version to contain both the English and the Greek in such a way that you'll see that since I regenerated the report, now my John 3.16 is in English. I can read it, right? <coughs> now, that's, that's okay, because I I'm, want to be able to read the English, but I wanted to do exegetical work in John 3.16. I want to know what the Greek words are. I don't want to know what the English words are. Well, as we scroll down this report, you're going to see that you still have all of the Greek words uh, in your individual word study. So we'll, we'll look at that. But leave this on the ESV, uh, reverse interlinear for right now. Did anybody have a hard time finding the ESV, reverse interlinear? Okay. If you're a Greek scholar, as I've been told I'm not, so uh, I, you know, I have to use these tools that help me, uh, you can stay with the Greek text, that's fine. The first section of this report is grammars. Does everybody have grammars as the first section of the report? All this is trying to do is it's trying to tell you that there are some unique uh, grammatical events within this particular pericope. Uh, and it's just trying to include, let you know that there's some interesting things going on with just the grammar of this verse. If you look, now I probably have some that you don't have, uh, but... Do you all have the varieties of dependent clauses? Is that one that you all have? Okay. Click on that for a second. And it's just going to open up this Greek New Testament insert, and it's going to talk about these conditional clauses. It's going to give you some idea of what's going on there. So, again, these, are, these tools tend to be more <coughs> advanced Greek tools. But you can see, if you remember Denny talking in exegesis class, one of the things you want to look at is the, is the grammar of your pericope. So this is cluing you in automatically to some unique grammatical constructions within your pericope. That can be very, very helpful. Now, again, like any of these other reports, right next to the title of the report, you have a little minus sign or a plus sign, and if you click on it, it will expand and contract that particular section of the report. If you have a computer that tends to run a little slower, close these reports. Just collapse them. Just click on that little minus sign so that they all you end up seeing is just the title of the report. Your report then will run much faster because when you expand a particular area is when it will run that part of the report. With about 10 or 15 different sections in some of these reports and it's trying to run them all at the same time, if you don't care about visualizations, for example, for right now, well, why use the processor time to generate that report, right? Just collapse it. I'll show you later how to just get rid of it completely. Um, but collapse it, and then if you want to look at the visualizations, you can open it. It'll generate that part of the report. So it speeds up your reports pretty considerably sometimes. Question about the grammars. Now, again, that's more advanced Greek, so I don't want to spend a lot of time going through the details. Uh, but, for example, the last one that I have is talks about the infinitive without the article. Well, if you don't understand what infinitives are and you don't understand what a definite article is yet, this report's not going to help you a whole lot, okay? So uh, just know that that information is there. The second section, 
I'm only going to touch on briefly, and it's called visualizations. I need to tell you that it's beyond the scope of this course, so we will not be getting into it. We may get into some of it at the end, but they have done a very, very cool thing with Logos. You now have syntactical databases and syntactically clause boundary uh, delineated New Testaments. What that means is that rather than just have it be verbs and nouns and adjectives, they are parts of speech. You can search for the subject of a clause where the verb is love, for example. Who in the New Testament loves the way God does? And so through these, this opentext.org syntactically analyzed Greek New Testament, um, we now have the capability to search beyond the morphology of a word, and morphology we'll get to, but into how the word actually functions within a clause or a sentence or a verse. Folks, I'm telling you that this is going to be a very, very powerful tool. It's complicated. Uh, it's complicated because you're starting to deal with uh, some different dynamics and some different thought processes. But it's very, very cool the kinds of reports and the kinds of searches you can do because you're no longer saying, show me all the nominative nouns. Now, typically in Greek, nominative nouns are subjects, but they're not always the subject of a sentence. Now I can say, show me the subject of the, of the passage, uh, regardless of whether it's nominative or, or what kind of structure it is. So uh, it's very interesting. If you click on it just once, it's going to open an interesting looking window, just so that you can see it. And you'll notice you've got all of these arrows going all over the place. These are all clauses. Oops, didn't mean to do that. These are all clauses that um, it's broken down into. You'll see that John 3.16 is actually uh, broken down into a couple of clauses. Uh, the primary clause here is the first part, uh, and the second part goes down through here. And you can do all kinds of filtering and searching for these head terms and in these word groups and search for specifiers and definers and all that kind of stuff. I just want you to know that what we're going to do in this class, by the time we're done, is going to feel like we're going really deep. We're still just t touching the hem of the garment here uh, with what is possible and what's available. The Logos blog site that I told you about yesterday, uh, one of the guys on there has done a number of videos, and you can actually get to them through the Logos website on all this syntactic searching and how these syntactic databases work. I'm actually working through that myself right now. Um, it's the kind of thing where I have to watch a video two or three times to get to really grasp what he's doing and why he's doing it. Uh, but it's, it's very cool stuff. Again, it's another reason, too, to reinforce the idea that you need to learn Greek. The program's not going to do it for you. Why would you search for a particular thing a particular way? Well, if you don't understand Greek construction, you wouldn't. And so your knowledge of Greek will help you go deeper in this tool. So that's enough for visualizations. We're going to see that pop up in a couple of other reports. It's not called visualizations, it's, but it's still dealing with the Greek, uh, the syntactic databases, and we'll deal with that. The next section is called apparatus. What is a, what is a critical apparatus? Who can tell me what the apparatus is? Mike, do you know? tells us about the Greek, typically it's based on textual variances. There are a number of words and passages throughout our New Testament that have uh, varying degrees of certainty as to whether they're part of the original manuscript. You remember Denny has talked about it in exegesis. We now have, what's the current count of New Testament manuscripts? Denny, do you know? It's over, over 5,000? 5,600. Last number I heard I thought was 52, 5,300 or something like that. There's like 5,600 manuscripts. And so as they put them together, the scholars denote how certain they are of certain passages being included and certain ones not. How many of you do not have apparatus? What 
what library did you get, Brett? Silver or gold? You should have it. Uh, I don't know why you don't, so we'll we'll look at that. Yeah, the update won't do it. Um, the silver does not have the apparatus? No. Okay, how many of you that raised your hand have the silver library? Okay, well, then that's probably the issue. Um, it may just be a function of the gold. You can add the book uh, or books themselves without upgrading all the way to gold uh, to do this. Uh, but you can just take notes or pay attention while we're going through this section to see what it does and see how valuable you would find it. If you're going to do a lot of detailed Greek work, having an apparatus is important. Basically, it shows you what manuscripts say what, and it also tells you whether or not a passage is certain to be uh, a part of the, the New Testament or not. There are very few uh, that were not, you know, that are in serious question. Danny? When you cover over your son getting his symbols and get all up over there in the top right, Yes. Yes, it does look like Latin. It's Tischendorf's um, <coughs> Novum Testamentum Graeca. Okay. Is there, um, is there a way to make that image? Yeah, um, actually, what I use for my apparatus is actually Metzger's apparatus, which is a <coughs> separate book that doesn't, in, it's not automatically included in this particular report. So I don't typically look at the apparatus as part of my exegetical guide. I actually have Metzger's um, textual commentary, and I open that in a workspace, and we'll show you how to do that later. But I don't have any way as part of this report to select uh, which tools are opened with apparatus. That's just built in here. So I don't have any way to change that right now that I know of from this report. Now, again, the apparatus is going to tend to be uh, more involved for deeper Greek studies, but it's important to know that it's there, uh, especially since most of you, some of the Greek stuff, especially when it gets into the more detailed areas, since most of you are just beginning Greek, I'm just trying to let you know that these reports are there. Uh, they'll make more sense to you later. Right now, uh, it's Will's job to teach you textual variances and all of that kind of stuff later on. Or you'll actually pick that up in how we got the Bible uh, quite a bit as well. The section that's the most important in this, in this passage is word by word. And that's, that's really what we wanted to get to. You'll notice that the first word that's highlighted in my verse is God. Now, if I was looking at a Greek text, it would be Theos. Uh, but since I'm using this ESV reverse interlinear, it's showing me, me that my uh, the word that I'm looking at is God, but then it gives me the Greek word right underneath it. It tells me the word is theos. Who can make a guess as to what this G number is? G2316, what is that? That is Strong's Greek number uh, for theos. You also have a little speaker here. Click on the little speaker. Make sure your volume's turned up. <laughs> My volume's not. Deos. 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 The little speaker right next to the word. Look on my screen. See right here. Just, just click on it. You're gonna regret that. I know. <laughs> But I figure if you all do it once and get it out of the way, it's kind of, you know, otherwise we're going to be putting up with it the whole time. It's kind, of like when I, it's kind of like when I took Greek, the first day of Greek class, Ken Dottie said, okay, everybody say, it's all Greek to me. And we all said, it's all Greek to me. And he said, okay, it's the last time I want to hear it throughout the course. So we've all played with the little pronounce button. Now you can turn your volume back down. So the word is Theos. It's Strong's number is 2316. And then in, in black here, in bold, it's giving you what, what they refer to as the English gloss. Basically, this is how the word is translated. Okay? 
So this word is translated deity or God. And it's getting that translation in mind from BDAG. Yours may be from something different. That's okay. Uh, I have uh, Art and Gingrich as an add-on. Before the end of this quarter, you will want it too. I've suggested that everybody get it when they buy their, uh, their software. But by the time this quarter is over, you're going to see why you really need it. Um, it's a tremendous tool. Next to that is this little funny little chart. This is actually called a density graph. Now, the density graph is really pretty neat because it tells you automatically how many times the word occurs in the New Testament. So that 1317 is telling you that the word theos occurs 1317 times in the New Testament. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to count those manually. But the problem becomes, do I really care how many times it occurs in the entire New Testament? The answer is yes, because there's times when you run this report and you're going to see that number is like two, but that number is one. In the entire New Testament, it occurs only one time, and you're looking at the one verse where it occurs. So it can be very powerful. But look at the little bars that are next to it. If you hover over the bars, it's going to tell you how many times in that book that word occurs. So, for example, I, I scrolled over about the fifth bar, and it tells me that Theos occurs 153 times in Romans. And it occurs 106 times in 1 Corinthians. It occurs 79 times in 2 Corinthians, and so on. Yes? Yes. 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 That's exactly the color coding that's going on. The light blue in the front is uh, the Gospels. The red one is Acts. The uh, other ones are Epistles. Uh, and then the last one are the Catholic Epistles and, and so on. I'm in the same version that you have, and mine says uh, 1,316. Um, are, are you using the ESV reverse interlinear as your main text? Mm -hmm. Does your say 16 too? 317. Uh, I'll have to look at why this would be different. Um, well, because they have God. Because you have the VDAG though. The VDAG is not going to change your count. Uh, so I'll have to look at that and see what, what the difference is. Now, that, that brings up a good point, and And it, that's not the reason we're having a difference here. But I do want to talk about this for just briefly. We'll get into it more when we get into manual mode. How do word counts work? Uh, you know, every now and then you'll hear a preacher say, this word occurs 17 times in the New Testament. Well, from what? From the NIV? Or from the NAS? From the English? Or from the Greek? From the Textus Receptus or the UBS4? You really have to, when you start talking about word counts, you, you really have to be more specific, and Logos is definitely going to be more specific, what are you looking at? Right now, we're looking at the ESV reverse interlinear. So the word counts are based on the Greek text that's involved with the ESV reverse interlinear, which is the NA27 or the UBS4. Okay? So when you start talking about word counts, you need, you need to start asking yourself more questions. Am I just searching for the word love in the English and it occurs... X number of times in the Gospel of John, or have I really looked at what the Greek word is for love, and it occurs that many times? Do you follow the difference? And we're going to get into all of that, because once we start breaking down the text, you really have to ask yourself a, a number of questions. One of the things that occurs very often is that you have one English word that's translated by multiple Greek words. Does that, does that make sense? For example, in, in uh, John chapter 20, the dialogue with Peter and Jesus. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. I don't know how many of you realize that Jesus is using one word for love and Peter is using a different word for love in that entire dialogue. Jesus is, is using agape. He's saying, do you 
love me in that self-sacrificing way. And Peter is responding, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. He's using phileo instead of agape. So Jesus is asking one question and Peter is answering with a different word. Well, those are the kinds of things you have to ask yourself when you're doing word counts and when you're searching for words. If I just search for the word love, it's going to include both of those words if I'm searching in my English text, right? I'm just going to have Jesus saying love and Peter saying love and Jesus saying love and Peter saying love. And it's interesting that at the end of that dialogue, Jesus actually changes his word. Jesus asks Peter, do you phileo? Do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, you know that I do. So there's something going on there with the words that we need to be aware of. But when we start to look at word counts, we have to ask ourselves, what text is being analyzed and how are we doing that word count? Is it based off the Greek word? Is it based off the English word? Uh, but I am not sure why you have 316 instead of 317. Uh, so we'll need to look at that. You'll also notice that my tallest bar is looks like it's fourth or fifth from the end, and it's 1 John, and it has 62 occurrences. Now, wait a second. Earlier, when I looked at Romans, for example, Romans has 153 occurrences, but the bar isn't as long as the one for 1 John. Why is that? You can give me an idea of what's going on there. Well, it's not just color-coded, but... Right. So you have more occurrences in fewer verses is what that's trying to tell you. It's a proportional bar. Uh, Romans has so many more verses, but even though it has more occurrences, the occurrences don't occur as frequently as they do in 1 John. Does that make sense? So the reason those bars are different lengths is trying to clue you in on the density of occurrences. That's why it's called a density graph. Now, I have a trouble with this little tiny graph. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to hover over the right thing. I mean, it's neat information, and, and you can get to it. You get used to it pretty fast. Uh, but double click on it for a second, or single click on it, I guess. You can just single click on it. Just click once. On anyone. It doesn't matter. Just click on the 316 or 317 or somewhere in that graph. And my machine is acting strange. And under the pull down at the top, select number of hits in book. It should be the second one from the top. And it will regenerate this list. This is a little easier for me to get my hands around. Basically, this is the same little chart, but it's in a bigger format. It's vertical. It's not color-coded. But it's the, basically the same information. But now I'm just looking at the number of occurrences. It's not trying to do it proportionally. It's just trying to show me that where the most occurrences reside. And you'll notice that it shows up in Acts 167 times, Romans 153 times, Corinthians 106 times. Powerful visual tool to get a clue as to what's going on here. Now go back up to where it says number of hits in book and scroll down to about the middle of that report and you'll see number of hits in chapter. And it'll take a little longer to run the report. Some of you are done. And now it breaks down every occurrence of the word by chapter. So as you scan through here, you start to notice, okay, here's one. 21 times in Romans 1, the word theos occurs. 21 times in 1 Corinthians 1, theos occurs. See, oh, there's a big one. 29 times in 1 John 4. Do you see how using this tool you can start to see where these, this word is used the most? Now, theos is a pretty common word, 1,300 occurrences. It's, it's not unusual for a lot of these bars to look similar. But when we look at some of these other words in, in this uh, report, you're going to see that these charts start to get to be pretty dramatic. You start to really be able to notice 
a density of uses in a particular section of the New Testament. And if you're going to study the word agapao, go ahead and close this report for just a second. And, and leave your exegetical guide open, but just close that chart report. Go down. Your next word in the list is agapao. It's loved, cherished, 143 times in the New Testament. How many does yours say, Terry? Okay. Click on that to open that graph Bible search results report again. And scroll through here for a second. Does anything stick out to you? First John what? Do you see how visually that pops off the page at you? Now, why is it showing up so much in 1 John 4? Well, if you go to 1 John 4, and or you look at your text in 1 John 4, look at how peppered it is with the word love. I mean, 15 times, and I think there's 23 or 24 verses in 1 John 4. So almost every verse has an occurrence of the word love. If you're going to study agapao as a concept, where are you going to start? Probably 1 John 4. Now, how did you know that before you ran this report? You really didn't. Do you see how this can help channel your study into a particular area of Scripture? Now, after 1 John 4, where would you go? Probably John 14, right? It occurs ten times in John 14. So you start to see patterns seven times in Ephesians 5. This is an interesting thing that I I find interesting. Look at the occurrences in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, one time. Ephesians 2, one time. Ephesians 5, seven times. Ephesians 6, one time. So out of 11 occurrences in Ephesians, Ephesians, seven of them occur in chapter 5. Again, it helps you focus your study time to say, if I'm looking at this word, that's where I'm going to start. There are a number of other reports, uh, ways to focus this graph. You have number of verses with hits in a book, number of verses with hits in a book versus the number of verses in the book and so on, number of hits in a book per thousand words in a book. These are all proportional reports to try to help you see, based on the size of the book, where the most occurrences appear. Actually, you cannot, and that is a bug. Um, You need to call tech support at Logos. This was happening to some folks. Have have you updated? You've run the update? For some reason, every now and then, that's what it was doing. It's just running for every chapter in the New Testament. It's not filtering out where the uses occur. It's just doing every chapter it hasn't ever done that for me, so I haven't had the problem. But I've had two students that called tech support and they fixed it right away. So, uh, Which brings me to another point. I'm not going to be able to fix every problem. Some things I may be able to tell you how to fix. Logos tech support is awesome. The people there are really do a good job overall. I mean, it's like any company, as they get bigger every now and then, you may hit somebody that's just not in the mood to help you. But I have not had that experience with Logos. Uh, they are usually very willing to help, and usually they can walk you through it on the phone and get you resolved and, and back going in just a few minutes. So go, get familiar with their phone number <laughs> uh, because oftentimes that's going to be your best result is to give them a call and say, hey, I'm, I'm th- I have this occurring. I don't understand why, and they'll be able to fix it for you. Sorry if that seems kind of like a cop-out, but I don't know why that particular event happens. You can change colors are really the only properties that you can change within these reports. Um, I I tend to just leave it the way it was with the default. Uh, But you can change it to black and white or bright colors or that kind of stuff, and it moves along. Now, one of the cool things that you can do with this, uh, one of the buttons that you have at the top, you should have a few. You should have size. You should have hide zero items. Click on, that's where we, that's new. Click on hide zero items. Do you see it in the top of your menu? Expand your window maybe a little bit. 
You should have three icons, four icons in the upper right-hand corner. The center one is a circle with a zero in it. <laughs> Click on hide zero items. It should take all your zero chapter hits away. There you go. Tech support. <laughs> I'll send you a bill. I can fix every problem. Um, the, um, the last one in that chain, not the question mark, Everybody knows that that little question mark box is kind of the use, universal symbol for help, okay? So if you want to use their help system, you're not going to talk to somebody, but go through help questions or stuff. That's what that little question mark is. But the one right next to it says export to export to Excel. Say that fast three times. Um, you can actually export this to an Excel spreadsheet document uh, and have all the math built in here which is kind of neat. I haven't had a need to do that, but if I was going to print it out, for example, for a Bible class or something, or I just wanted to put it in my notebook, uh, I might consider exporting it to an Excel sheet. And then I can do other analyses based on the math that Excel can provide. So that's kind of a neat little feature. And thank you for having that problem, Mike, because you just helped me solve other people's problems as well. Okay, so that's enough with the Bible Search result, the graph, the search results, and the vital density graph. Does anybody have any questions about that little density graph? How did you get that one to where the bars were going up and down? You turn it, when you look at those choices, uh, let me get it open again here. Right up here next to how the graph is being built, you have muted bars or you have op options for colors and things. Yeah. You can do either bars or columns. When you do it columns, it turns it horizontal. When you do it okay. bars, it's doing it vertically. Right. Questions about density hits. Now, the nice part is that the number of occurrences, what, what did Denny talk about earlier? When you're looking for keywords and that kind of stuff, number of occurrences can be important as far as determining uh, keywords. Frequency of words can often be the case. So, uh, you can look at those things that way. Moving along with what other information here we have, the next line of information about a word in the, in the exegetical guide is the morphology of the word. Now, what does morphology mean? Basically, it's the structure of the individual word. So, it tells you whether it's a noun or an adjective. It tells you whether it's a, a verb and what tense it is, what case it is, what voice it is, all of those kinds of things. And you're all learning that right now in Greek class. Um, so this stuff will make more sense as it goes on. But when we look at, at John 3.16 and we look at theos, it's a noun, nominative, singular, masculine. So it's a masculine noun, singular rather than plural, and it's in the nominative case. As you scroll down to agapao, for example, which is the next word in my list, you'll see that it's a finite verb, third person, singular, aorist, indicative. Okay? Now, for those of you that haven't had Greek yet, all of that sounds bizarre. A lot of that will make a lot more sense very, very soon. And it will become very important. But even for those of us that have had Greek and haven't had it for a while, and I'm looking at theos, and it's a nominative noun. It's like, what on earth is nominative? I don't remember what nominative means. Just hover over it. It gives you a definition of the nominative case. Scroll down to where agapao is and hover over aorist. And it gives you an explanation of what an aorist verb is. So we talked earlier, I talked earlier, about the idea that Logos can help you learn Greek. I, I mean, don't just turn your Greek knowledge over to the software. Start to learn these things. Um, when you're not sure what an aorist is, look at these definitions. Work on remembering these definitions, and you won't have to look it up every time. Um, it, it will become very, very helpful to you, and as time goes on, since these definitions are so close by, uh, they're just a hover away, it'll be very easy for you to learn what this morphology is and how 
uh, you might use it and what it, how it helps in the translation or the understanding of the particular passage. So it makes sense. Questions? The next thing you should have is a list of key links. Now yours are going to be different than mine. Uh, my first one is Art and Gingrich, and then I have the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. What's the first one you all have in your list? Just hover over it, and it'll give you the title of the book. Analytical Lexicon of the Greek New Testament. Well, that may be a good book, but do you really want that to be your first one? This is where we have to get behind the scenes a little bit. These are called key links. And you really need to understand the concept of key linking. It's not that important that you understand how everything in Logos works. But this particular concept is going to be very, very important for you to get as we move into a more manual mode, okay, so that you can control the program. One of the coolest things about Logos is that you can customize it to the resources that you like the most, okay? So what we're looking at here is a thing called data types and key linking. Follow me the best you can. We're going to talk about it more later. I don't want to blow your mind with, with technical jargon, but at the same time, and I don't want to drop stuff all over the floor, but I did anyway, so that means I'm going to confuse you anyway, too. Um, data types and key links. Every word that you look at in Libronics, in a book, fits a particular data type. Now, if you're looking at a Bible reference, most likely it's a Bible data type. It's a reference to a, a Bible passage. If you're looking at an English word, it's the English data type. If you're looking at a Greek Strong's number, it's a Greek Strong's number data type. If you're looking at a Hebrew Strong's number, it's a Hebrew Strong's number data type. If you're looking at a page number, it's a page number data type. And one of the things that makes Libronics so powerful is that every bit of information in a resource is linked somehow to these data types. Okay? If it's a Greek word, it's linked to the Greek data type. So once you know what the data type is, you can then control books that are indexed to that particular data type and say, when you are looking at a Greek word, the first book I want you to look at is this book because, first of all, it's, top, it's indexed to the Greek data type, and it's my favorite book. So I want you to go there first. Does that make sense? We're going to actually do that with a, with a word of warning. Where we're going in the software right now can mess things up, okay? We're going to actually start changing the way Libronics functions. So when you go into these areas of Libronics, just don't go in willy-nilly and change things to everything because it is going to change how the program functions. And it, sometimes it can be hard to get home again. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the birds eating the bread trail behind you. You turn around and it's like, all right, I don't know why this is coming up when I click on a Greek word and I'm seeing Coptic something, uh, but I, and I don't know how, where I changed it or how to fix it. Well, that can be problematic. So I want you to go to Tools, your Tools menu at the top, Options, Key Link. Tools, Options, Key Link. you're going to get a dialog box that opens up that says key link options. I can't make my window any bigger than this, so we're just, you're just going to have to you know, do your best. You'll notice on the left-hand column I have key linking and display. For right now, I want to make sure that we're in the key linking section. And we have data types. Now, just click on the pull-down arrow for the data types and scroll through this list. These are all the different data types that exist in all the different resources within Libronics. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Some of them I understand very well. 
Others I don't understand at all. Uh, but that I don't mess with those. <laughs> and the rule of thumb here is if you don't know what you're changing in this menu, step away from the computer. Okay, close the window, go back to the passage guide, and just accept what you're getting. Okay, because again, you can you can mess things up. Select Greek as your data type. Scroll through this list and find where it says Greek. Not Greek number, not Greek grammar, not Greek morphology or Greek Strong's number. Just the word Greek. You have two windows, two small windows. The one at the top says resource or action to use first. And most likely it's empty on yours. Is that the case? Then down below, you have another window that says default order of resources and actions. And you have an entire list of books with little check marks next to them. Is that what you have? What do you know, based on what we've just talked about, what do you know about all of the books that are listed in that bottom window? They're indexed to the Greek data type. That's the reason they're showing up here is that if you double-click on a Greek word, you can find that Greek word in these books. Okay. Now, you don't have the same books I do, but I do know that you should have two. Everybody should have two that I want you to look for. The first one is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. If you scroll down, you should have a place where you have the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, if you scroll down a little further, they may be right next to each other, you should find the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament abridged in one version or one volume. Does everybody have that? I want you to click on that, that abridged in one volume, and I want, to, I want you to click Promote. What did it do? It moved it from your bottom list to your top window, right? So what you just told Libronics is now when you look at a Greek word, key link, I want you to look at the TDNT abridged in one version. What do we call TDNT abridged in one version? Little Kittle. So when I say Little Kittle, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's Little Kittle, okay? So now when you look at a Greek word, key link, it's going to go to little kittle first. For right now, all I want you to do is close this window now that you've done that. And go back and regenerate your exegetical guide on John 3.16. Just select John 3.16. Uh, just hit enter again. It's not going to work. I thought it would just refresh if you hit the green button. The reason it mine's not is I think I don't have any changes. If it won't refresh, you're going to have to close your exegetical guide and then just rerun it to John 3.16. When it runs... Look at Theos again. What is the first book that's listed in your list underneath Theos? It should say TDNTA, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, abridged in one version. You just told Logos that that's my favorite book. And when I'm looking at a Greek word, the first place I want to go is TDNT, abridged in one version. Now, mine is Art and Gingrich, and that's the way I'll stay. But click on TDNTA under Theos. Just click once. It opens a window, right? You can scroll it, make the window the full size of your screen so that you can see it. This is page 322 from Little Kittle. <laughs> now, the way I know that is if you look at the top, you look at your current reference... It probably gives you a page number. If you go two little icons over to where it says active index, it looks like a little piece of paper with the corner folded down. When you click on it, you'll notice that you have two choices, page number and topics. 
in this case, it's set to page number, and that's why you can see the page number there. But now you have the entire little Kittle uh, word study on <coughs> Theos right there, one click away from your exegetical guide. Now, what's your second book? It's that analytical Greek lexicon, right? Okay, so now, without changing anything else, go to Tools, Options, Key Link. It should still be at the Greek data type because you <coughs> haven't changed it. Look at the first book in that lower window. Make sure you're scrolled all the way to the top of that list. What is the first book? Analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament. Are you starting to understand what you're seeing here now? Anything that you promote to that upper window is going to be looked at first. Once it exhausts all the resources in that upper window, it's going to go to the second window and start with the first book, and it's going to go down from there. All right? So now you can control that any way you want. Scroll through the bottom window and find TDNT, not the abridged, but the full... Theological Dictionary of the New Testament and promote it. Once you have it in the upper window, when you select it, you can say up or down. You can control how all of those fit. Do you see how you can change it to be ahead of Little Kittle or behind it? You can move it up and down in that list. So I, what I tend to recommend is, and we're going to test your knowledge of LNR last quarter, I'm going to ask you first, go to Little Kittle. Why? Before you go to the full-blown TDNT, why would you go to Little Kittle first? It's our basic source. It's got less information than the full-blown TDNT, right? So you can get through the information faster. Go to Little Kittle first. Start to read through this, the word study. If you want to go deeper, then move on to full-blown TDNT. So if I were you, I would put Little Kittle as my first resource. TDNT is my second. All right? Now, did any of you buy Art and Gingrich? Promote it to first. <laughs> uh, always, always, always. Make sure that it is the first one in your Greek data type key links options so that it's always at the top of your list. It, it's, it really is the fastest way uh, to get through some of these Greek studies. And most often you have links within Art and Gingrich to TDNT and everything else anyway. BDAG is the way they call it. Why does, why does Logos call it BDAG? Bauer, good. See, you can be taught. <laughs> Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich is why, where the initials come from. Even though we call it Art and Gingrich, it was actually originally done by Bauer. So that's why that's like that. Okay, so you've promoted TDNT. Find any other one. You might have uh, Wust's. Is, it, is that how you pronounce it, Denny? Wust's word studies in the Greek New Testament. Scroll through that bottom window and see if you have Wust's which is a pretty decent little word study uh, tool. If you can find it, promote it to the upper window. Um, what else do I have in my window? Wusts. See, in my upper window for my Greek, those are the four that I have. Is I have Arden Gingrich, I have Little Kittle, I have full-blown TDNT, and I have Wusts. Our, our the four that I start with. Make sure that you have at least three up there. It really doesn't matter what the other one is. Uh, you can leave it the analytical uh, if you want, but Wusts is decent. But for right now, I want you to have at least three sources in that upper window. The reason you don't, you can't find it is because it's called A Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament and Other Early Christian Literature. So, add, yeah, so click that and promote it and then make sure that it's at the top. 
select it in that upper window and move, use the up and down arrow to, to change its order. It's called an, a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. The abbreviation for it is BDAG. Okay, so does everybody have at least three books in that upper window? Okay, look down below those two windows. You're going to see something that says number of windows to open on a key link. And it's going to have a number. I want you to change that number to three. Now, yes? Okay. It means that you haven't purchased it. Uh, so it doesn't come automatically with your silver library. It's, it's something that... It. Well, it may be, but if so, it's not been unlocked, and so you need to call Logos and say, hey, I purchased it, but it's not unlocked, and okay. they need to unlock it for you. Oh, okay. Um, if you've actually, you know, got the license, they can help you do that. Now, number of windows to open on a key link... Three, Brett, what is it going to do if I double click on a Greek word? It's going to open three. It's going to open three windows. What three windows is it going to open? My top three Okay. Yep. So go ahead and close this key links option. And go back to your exegetical guide. And I and you can't just double click because we're in an exegetical guide. It's going to want to run another report. But I want you to right mouse click on the word Theos. And you'll see where it says selected text in the pull down. And the first command at the top is execute key link. So... Right-click Theos, go down to Selected Text, Theos, and then Execute Key Link, and see what happens. It should open three windows, each open to Theos, and they should be the three that are at the top of your list. So, Little Kittle should be one, TDMT should be another, and whatever your third one is, that's up to you. Now, if you, if you downloaded the Power Tools option the other night, you should see something like I've got here. At the bottom of this window, I have these little tabs. And when you click on them, you're actually cycling back and forth between these three windows. You actually have three different windows open. But when you put windows on top of each other that are exactly the same size, Livronics puts this line of tabs along the bottom. So it lets you flip back and forth between books real easy. Again, go back to your desktop paper model. You have Little Kittle, TD&T, and some analytical lexicon on your desk, and you're trying to compare all three. You've got to jump all over the place. Here, you just have to click on the little tabs at the bottom, and it's automatically going to cycle through to all of these. Now, who can tell me, Larry? What volume and page number? Yeah, notice how I did that? That's because he wasn't making eye contact, so I figured I'd wake him up. Are you? Have you run these key links? Do you have these windows open? I'm looking for a particular key He doesn't have anything in the top window. doesn't have anything in the top window. Okay, well, you may have only promoted two books. Right. Do you have TD&T? Tell me what volume and page number the word study for Theos is in TD&T. Uh, it's the no, full-blown TD&T. Volume and page number. Since the abridged is only one volume, I wouldn't need a volume number. Is it there? Who can tell me what volume 
man whose blood volume and page number? Uh, 364. Volume 3, page 64. Now, if you go upstairs and you pull volume 3 and open page six, open to page 64, you guaranteed you are going to find this word study. These are not just electronic texts from the book. These are electronic books. So when you cite something from TDNT, it's going to give you the page number and the volume so that you can do a proper text note in MLA form. That's cool. Now you have the power of a paper library. You have the citable resources that are verifiable, all from your electronic version. Brett, were you going to start to ask a question? I don't know. I don't have a page 64. It actually skips, but when I push the upper arrow once, it goes to 63 and down, it goes to 65. It's not deep in there. What is your active index set to? My active index, I did everything the way that we set it. Okay, when you go to. Two icons over from where it's giving you volume three, page 60, whatever. <coughs> Click on volume and page. Make sure that's there. Does it tell you then? It says volume three. Even before it said volume three, page 65. But again, it skips to page 62. I pushed up one. I'm going to find it. Yeah, but it's it it should be correct. Yeah. What I need to make sure that you're understanding from this section is that you can control what books you look up words when you do a key link. You need to understand this concept of key linking. Key links are basically the books that are indexed by a particular data type. If I am looking at the word Ephesus in English and I want to do studies on that word, I'm going to go in and adjust my English key links for the books that I want it to be, right? So I'm going to promote books that I want to look up English words in, not just the Webster's Dictionary, which is going to be what your first one is. So you can control what books are activated at a key link. Does that make sense? Questions, comments? Yes? I'm having trouble with my uh, VNX. Maybe you just have a class or some kind of key okay. linking to my church father. I don't think it's a problem. I don't Okay. To any of them? Like it'll give me Milo and just Jason. Um, no, I'll explain why. It's, is your early church fathers in Greek? <laughs> See, our early church fathers are in English. It's not, it's not full-blown like Loeb where you have the Greek morphology in your early church fathers. So it's not going to link to your resource because you don't have the Greek morphology with it. I don't either. They don't have it available yet. Uh, but we'll t I'll talk about that with you at the break. Questions about key linking. Now, the first thing I want you to do is go back and open Tools, Options, Key Link. And change that number of windows to open on a key link back to two or less. One or two, doesn't really matter. You want a couple. Three sometimes is a lot. You can put as many as you have resources. I can put this number to 15. And whenever I execute a key link on a Greek word, it's going to open 15 windows. Well, that's overkill. And it's going to slow your processor down and you're going to have any problem. I don't recommend that you keep this number any higher than three or four. Okay? But know that you can if you want to. So... I would change it to three or less, and then go ahead and close it. <clears throat> we have five minutes before the break. Now, one of the things I want to show you is, see, it opened these three windows. Look at my screen for a second. I have three windows. Each one 
is there. They're just stacked on top of one another. But I've got three different windows open. So when they're all stacked on top of each other and I want to close them, i got to close each one one at a time. You need to look at those tabs that are at the bottom of your screen because if Logos starts running really slow, all of a sudden you look down and you realize that you haven't closed a window in 45 minutes. You've been doing all kinds of stuff and running all kinds of reports and double-clicking on keywords and key links and launching stuff. And the next thing you know, you have 27 windows open and they're all active and they're all trying to do stuff. So make sure that you're controlling your environment by keeping track of what you have open. If you aren't getting that little tabbed interface at the bottom, well, the windows just stack up on top of each other and you don't even know that they're open. You don't even see them. Uh, stacked there because there's no little tabbed interface to give you that clue. So make sure that you're paying attention to that kind of stuff because it'll make a significant difference in uh, what you're able to do. How much of a difference if we kept two or changed to three? Not much. I, I mean, you're not going to have much of a hit. I usually keep my key links at two or three. For Greek, I'm at three. Uh, for others, not so much, uh, depending. I'm going to show you how to control English words in a little bit. So now, when you run an exegetical guide, it's going to look in your favorite books, or at least the ones I've told you to make your favorites. Now that you know how to do that, you can change that to anything you want. If you don't want BDAG in your list, even though you bought it, don't put it in your list. It doesn't matter to me. I think those three resources, and I think Denny would agree with me, that between BDAG, Little Kill, and Full Blown TDNT, you're looking at some major, major study resources. I mean, they're all right there. So if you would rather look at Vines, if you have Vines in your list, put it in there and promote it. Okay? That's fine. Hey, Ready? Mike? Yes. Is, is B there the same thing as Art and Gingrich? It is. Okay, it's that's the, what I wanted. Okay. It's the third edition now? Yeah, yeah, I got you, it. You startled me, Dan. I didn't know you were back there. Well... I knew you were about to take a break, and, and I, you mentioned the fathers, and of course, if they have Art and Gingrich, they can they can get the references in the fathers out of Art and Gingrich in the entry. In right. There. Yes, they can. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. Um, and we are going to go ahead and take a, a break. Are we going to be able to record after the break, uh, Dan, or is this it for today? No, this, this nice lady is going to uh, record after the break, Lord willing. Okay. Well, thank that nice lady for us. That's Pat. She's sitting right there. Thank you, Pat. You're welcome. Right now, the camera's on you, Dan, so all I'm seeing is you. Uh, but we're gonna, let's go ahead and take a break, and then we will talk to Pat in 15 minutes. Okay, now let me try something. Okay. Try hitting this, this button here and see if it goes to pause. Yeah. Let go of it. See if it. Yeah. 